Welcome back to another episode of Friends From Work, a podcast about all things in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, hosted by me, Robbie Earle, and by my longtime friend from work, Kyle Sconewell. And welcome to a very special episode, one of three that we'll be able to do this year. Um, This is our spoiler-free preview of Ant-Man and the Wasp, Quantumania. So if you are excited for the movie and you want a little bit of context and information about it, but you don't want any spoilers, this is a safe space. But quickly, I loved it so much. I loved it so much. And that's the most important takeaway. Um, Today is always unique because when we walk out of the theater the night of the premiere, it's like 11 p.m., we want to record our initial reactions episode always because we want Mm -hmm. just that, the initial reaction to it. The weird thing, though, is that that actually comes out next week. Mm -hmm. And because last week was a scripted saga so far, this is the first time in a while where we're actually catching up with people. And it's weird for us because we got to remember all the things we said about last night's episode, which actually airs next week, (laughs) and kind of reverse time here. But I'm excited about this. I'm really excited about this. Um, You can go check our social media reaction. We freaking loved the movie. Welcome to our uh, cool, vibey, speakeasy yeah. hotel. It's got the WandaVision flair. It's got the, I don't know, like I'm interrogating you flair. <laughs> but we're excited to be in uh, Hollywood, California again, back where we just need to be sometimes. And I wanted to start off today by telling you a little bit of a catch up here on my rewatch journey and my rewatch outside of the MCU journey. Yeah. Because in the last week, and I've been talking about this on Slack, for whatever reason, I think because football uh, is over for me and hockey was in a break and I haven't been playing as much Warzone or as much video games, Annika and I have had so much time to watch film. Mm-hmm. And in the last week alone, I've watched The Menu, Last of Us Episode 3, which kicked off my week. You know, I thought, oh, I'll watch a fun zombie show. Yikes. <laughs> it left me <laughs> contemplating life for like six days straight. Um, everything, everywhere, all at once. The Unbearable Weight of Massive Talent, which I showed Annika, Devotion, and then Black Adam. So really quickly, I'm going to do a quick 30-second review of each one. In next week's episode, we actually tease an outlet for some of this stuff. Yeah, so yeah. if you're a longtime Friends From Work listener, you're going to want to stay around to the end of next week's episode because we have maybe a few things we can explore and how we can talk about these things. Yeah. But in the short term, <laughs> what is this? Is it an actual timer? <laughs> Let's go. Okay, so 30 seconds? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so I watched uh, The Last of Us Episode 3. Absolutely rips your heart out. Um, my favorite shows are the ones where you come to the show for one thing, and mm-hmm. then you leave because the writers and directors have convinced you of a totally different thing. And I came to that show being like, oh, I played the video game. It'd be fun right. to learn about. Um, that post-apocalyptic world and see some zombies. And I left being like, wow, I care about the characters and I'm rethinking life. This had nothing to do with zombies. And I actually liked that. Yeah. (laughs) Wow. That's so impressive. That's so impressive. I can't do that. I I have to say there's any, any time you hear Max Richter kick in, you know that you're about to just experience an emotional gut punch. Mm -hmm. Like Candace and I were sitting there watching that episode and already, I mean, by, by the time you get to that scene, it's just a beautiful, like heart wrenching episode of television. Like one of the best episodes of television I've ever seen. And then you hear on the nature of daylight start yes. to come in and it's like, Oh my god! And you gosh. think about arrival. <laughs> well, I, dude, so I actually, yeah, I mean, arrival or, um, I mean, it's, it's, is it also shutter Island? I shutter think? Island. Yeah. Okay. I also watched the menu, which, uh, um, I'm not going to get into fully here because I have 30 seconds, but also because this might be one of the movies you and I talk about on the yeah. podcast, but you know, the movie, the menu doesn't reinvent the genre, but, it's so topical with its social commentary, especially with this podcast, right. what this podcast has always talked about. And that was the most delightful part. So that's what I'm yeah. going to want to get into when we actually cover the movie uh, in, in length. Well, and, and it's funny because I like I should have tried to use that last two seconds. <laughs> Impressive again. It's funny because you say it doesn't quite reinvent the genre. And I think what I loved about it, and one of the reasons why you are already going to watch it, but why I was kind of pressuring you to get to it because I I wanted to talk about it with you, is because 
I don't even know what the genre is. Like, it, from the trailers, you think, like, oh, this is, like, like a, a, a thriller comedy. kind of a thing. Or, yeah, like, but, yeah, I guess I guess it is a dark, it's a dark comedy more than anything. Um, but, yeah, I, yeah. it's so, it's just a really unique That's movie. kind of the point, honestly, yeah. of the whole film, is that right. you don't know what the genre is, kind of. Um, I watched Everything, Everywhere, All at Once. Absolutely the most heartwarming thing I've seen in a while. Mm -hmm. Um, I was in tears, legitimately. I think it hits you differently when you have uh, a wife, a family, child, etc. Mm -hmm. And it really hit me. Um, we loved it. What a spectacular movie. I know a ton of people on our Slack. It has like a cult following uh -huh. even amongst our listeners. Spectacular. It's this year's Parasite for me where I'm hoping it pulls out the best picture yeah. for way more than just that I liked it reasons. Right, right. I'm doing great, you by the way. <laughs> um, I'm not spoiling anything yet, but everything, everywhere, all at once might be the movie to kick off um, some coverage of other films yeah. for us because so, it is it is nominated for best picture, like you said. Um, Ninety five percent Rotten Tomatoes. Yeah, I mean the Oscars are in just over a month, uh, so yeah, I think it would it would be fun to to talk. So about So again, those. this is back to back to back nights. Then I wanted to show Annika the unbearable weight of massive talent, which we actually got a chance to see a screener like nine months ago together yeah, in yeah. Austin, yeah. randomly that Candace had set up. That's true. That was in like March um, or April, right? Really? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, really, really, really funny. Um, but it's not just that it's funny. It's really creative in the kind of comedy it is. It's not yeah. slapstick. It's just, it's like a comedy that's built on being like highbrow, self-aware. And it's very strange. Yeah. Like to actually watch Pedro Pascal and Nick Cage be that aware in what they're talking about. Oh. Um, by the way, Pedro Pascal, I found out, is a real actual Nicolas Cage fan, which is amazing. I didn't oh, make this that's one. Fun. But I was watching that and The Last of Us, and that then inspired me. That's not as emotional, by the way, but right, that then inspired right. me to um, think, like, dude, I want Pedro in the MCU. So I tweeted that. How can we get Pedro Pascal in the MCU, and what role could he play? And that actually started some fun discussion. So yeah. I watched Devotion. I'll start my own timer for your sake. Um, this I definitely don't need to talk about because you can go to the movie club if you're on Friends from Work Plus and you can listen to my full review of that. It's a good movie, not a great movie, but I watch it to learn what I can learn about Jonathan Major's acting and the variety he can bring to his acting before Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania, and I found it really helpful. And then at the end of that movie, I found myself getting choked up after all of it. It's based on a true story. Um, I'd say it's like an 8 out of 10. Good movie, not unbelievable, but that was fun and also heartwarming and emotional. <laughs> I made it again. Wow. And then lastly, and don't start the timer on this, you and I need to do an actual episode on the fact that I watched Black Adam and actually what that means for the film industry. What an abomination of a movie. Oh my gosh, it's so bad. Oh no. And it's not just bad. It's bad in that I legit get concerned. Like – when Martin Scorsese and James Cameron come out and rip superhero movies, this is why. And I actually think it hurts Kevin Feige's case in making a movie because these get lumped together. Like Ant-Man and the Wasp will get lumped together with Black Adam as a superhero movie. And they're not even close to the same yeah. conversation. You actually said something to me off air that I thought was so true. It's like Black Adam is not fun bad. It's it's soulless bad. Yeah. There, There's no – You've brought this up before. You may not like Multiverse of Madness, but at least when you're watching it, you can feel that Sam Raimi and Mike w Mike Waldron cared about what they were doing. Like right. they were trying their best, whether you like it or not. Right. I watched Black Adam. I'm like, does anybody care? Like, yeah. do the actors care? Do the directors care? I don't know. It literally feels like everyone's walking through just a CGI fest, and. There's no, it's crazy. It's crazy. Anyways, I'm sorry if you love that movie, <laughs> but <laughs> it's crazy to me. It's, I, I feel like they, they fed a lot of data to a bot and had it right. <laughs> <laughs> That's like the new trend. They probably did. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and, and I mean, which I don't know. I mean, I guess they needed to save the budget on on writers because geez that that movie uh like within a, a, a week or two it was already clear that it was going to essentially be a loss yeah they basically bailed on it which is which is wild because by some metrics Dwayne Johnson is the biggest movie star in the world so it's it and I like him I do like him yeah no and, and this he is just not coasts 
Yeah, yeah. His the entire film he has this look. Man, okay, you know what? That's this, all he does. You know what's movie. interesting about that though, and 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 we'll get to, <laughs> we'll get to this is where you have to be watching video. Um, <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. This is a. Uh, We'll get to this whenever we talk about Quantumania here in a moment, but the, the thing that has consistently separated Marvel from uh, not just DC, but other kind of franchise things like this in recent years, and again, I, Marvel, it's not like this has always 100% happened with Marvel, nor has it 100% not happened with other properties. That's not what I'm saying. But I think that the thing that makes Marvel unique is how consistently the actors and really the creators in general, they, they, it feels like they're bought in. Mm-hmm. And I think like, what I've noticed, we recently watched for the first time the other night uh, the DC League of Super Pets movie, the animated oh, movie. Yeah. Uh, and one, what's hilarious, and, and he's never responded like this before. But our dog is obsessed with it. Something about the way they represent dogs, representation matters. Um, <laughs> it's it, very like, accurate. He will get on, like you turn it on and he will get on the couch, center himself and just watch that movie. Beca- and they have like squeaky toys as an element. And every time he's like just locked. It's the most I've, I've ever seen him like be into entertainment. That's but funny. one thing I noticed in that even, because it's got like a crazy cast in terms of voice actors. And I noticed that, like, Dwayne Johnson in that movie, he's he's the lead, is also kind of phoning it in. Like, everyone else is doing great work. John Krasinski plays Superman. Like, a lot of really just kind of fun, fun appearances. And I like Dwayne Johnson, and I think that he's turned in some really great performances and other things. So I'm not saying that he doesn't have the ability, but it's funny to me because these movies came out not that far from each other, and, and... he at the time was kind of setting himself up as like, I'm going all in with DC and he was promoting it really hard. But then like you actually see the, the creative energy that even he's bringing to it. And then you compare like, and with what he was saying, right? Like I'm coming into DC, I'm reshaping it. Like get ready for the black Adam era. There's a new hierarchy. And it's, it's like, you think about that, like how it seems that Dwayne Johnson was trying to set himself up. And then you compare that to some of the central figures of the MCU, even if you don't go RDJ, which is, it's not really fair to compare RDJ to most actors, but like Evans even, like, it's just, a, it's a different, and again, that's, DC League of Super Pets had plenty of good performances, so I'm not saying that like DC is void of passion, I'm just saying I think that it's so, every time I see stuff like that, every time I see something like Black Adam, that just was cranked out because superhero movies are that's big. What I'm so saying, we should go dude, that's the larger conversation we'll have to have. Yeah, yeah, it's it's that's detrimental. It's and detrimental. in that way, you're almost thankful that it didn't do well, <laughs> right? I mean, because it shows like, yeah, I mean, that we're better than this. Well, dude, you know what? You know what's? Yeah, I mean, I, it's funny to me because I would even say, and then we can we can put a pen in this, but to compare Black Adam to to even like uh, like Let There Be Carnage which was not a good movie. I, I, that's even interesting to me because, I mean, Sony has a lot of the same issues DC does, but, like, even there, I would say, like, you watch it and it's Andy Serkis directing. They're and trying. They're trying to do something weird and, and fun, you know, which is, which is like, a, Sorry about that. you know, that, that feels uh, appropriate to the Venom character. It, it, it's, it's funny how, like, that's a movie that I thought was not good, but I didn't come away. That's more fun to watch. Yeah, and, and, I, and I didn't come away like depressed about the state of yeah, of sure. the you know the it, whereas like <laughs> with a movie like Black Adam you come away and it's like oh man I don't I don't even want to be what around it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> um, so another fun thing on the friends from work side is that uh, we've always wanted to we love the rewatch vibe and you kind of brought this up last week to me it's finally becoming enough time between the time that the phase four stuff came out and now to be considered a rewatch. So we do want to kind of work in um, maybe an episode per project as a rewatch, just like our old classic ones Mm -hmm. um, going forward. I bring that up because I'm currently on, I just finished far from home in my rewatch. And so I'm kind of thinking with that context. And I think there could be some really fun episodes 
now that we've had a couple years on some of these, right. we've watched WandaVision four times to come back and now mm-hmm. talk about it. So that will be kind of fun too. On that note, I haven't caught people up on trivia. Right. And so I can do this really quickly. But um, I had asked what uh, – basically a lost lyrics to finish the lyrics to mm-hmm. Agatha all along from WandaVision. And congratulations to Lance actually for getting to this first. And again, this was weeks ago, but um, she's insidious, so perfidious that you never even noticed. And the pity is pity, 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 pity. That was the part I was looking for. That's wild. Lance, <laughs> Lance, I, you have perfidious. That's why I took yeah. note of it. <laughs> My respect, because not only did I not know that. I like I could never in a million years have told you what those words it's were. It's too late to fix anything. Like I didn't now that I, <laughs> everything has gone wrong. I didn't know that those it's were the words Agatha. in the first place, and I certainly could not have memorized them. Naughty Agatha. <laughs> oh, I've listened to Agatha all along. I could have done that one. <laughs> I've listened to it so. I just said all along. I've listened to it so wow. much. <laughs> um, and then for this week, okay, trivia time. And this oh. is going to quiz you too. Here we go. Cue the music. What is the name? Oh, from Falcon and Winter Soldier. Yeah. What is the name of the senator that we see Bucky cross off his list? I think in the first episode. Yeah. So like he's making amends and he you get to see him actually cross off the list with mm-hmm. one senator in the car and he freaks her out with the car driving itself. Right. What's her name? Yeah. Yeah. And then from no. Spider-Man Far From Home, this is a really fun one, courtesy of my wife Annika. What cities does Peter travel to in that film? In order. What is the order of his entire trip? This one I can do. This one I can do. Including a couple of really hard to pronounce (laughs) cities. I know there's the one that would make it difficult for me to actually type up a a, a submission. Uh, Hint, my homeland. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. In more ways than one. (laughs) Well, really just the one. Um, (laughs) I'm Dutch. Um, Yeah, but also you're from... Yeah, oh, 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 I see what you're getting at. See? Okay, okay. Kind of two ways. Yeah. I see what you're getting at. But it would ruin... Yeah, yeah, we can't bring it up. Okay, uh, here's how we want to structure the rest of today. I literally, like an hour ago, Robbie, asked people, um, what do you want to hear from a spoiler-free episode? And in one hour, if you're watching online, look at this. I got all of these. Yeah, that's wild. Um, And so I think let's... Do an opening thought on, you know, obviously don't spoil anything from this point on. Give us an opening thought on just big picture now that you've had a morning to sleep on it and when wake up and think about it. What do you think? And then after that, we can kind of rapid fire these. And I haven't read them either. And then we can just see how much of this we can answer. Um, last thing, really briefly. There'll be a lot more information on this on our Patreon page, but we are partnering with Adam Tickets for a fun thing. If you are a Friends from Work Plus subscriber, you can get $5 off a ticket right now, which is actually a pretty significant discount. Yeah, I think it's only while supplies last. Um, but if you go to our Patreon page, we'll share the information. But if you're going to buy tickets to Ant-Man and the Wasp or to Guardians of the Galaxy or you're going to go to Ant-Man again or whatever – you might as well use a dope ticketing app that saves you $5. And I'm going to share that code on the plus page. So check that out with Adam tickets. And if you are looking to buy tickets through Adam anyways, which is a great app that you can use to get your tickets, you're already using something anyways, um, check the show notes and click on our referral link. It helps us if you uh, use that link before you buy your tickets, just so they know that we sent you. Okay. Let's get into Ant-Man and the Wasp, a spoiler free preview after a quick word from these sponsors. All right, so last night when we recorded our entire initial reactions episode that's going to come out next week, um, we truly did not know what anyone else thought other than overhearing a couple of people as we walked out of the theater. This morning, we've had a little bit of uh, hindsight where now we could read a few other tweets and we have sat on a little bit more. And from this point on, by the way, if you don't want to hear anything about it, this is your jumping off point, but we're going to talk about Amen and the Wasp spoiler free. I just want to say I freaking loved it. Like I, I know on here we were positive a lot and we say that a lot. I like loved it. I felt like I was watching 
Like my level of investment felt like almost pre end game. Like I, I loved it. So I'll give my overarching thought, but I woke up this morning realizing like I maybe even loved it more than most people. Like, um, you know, that's funny. Like yeah, we, yeah. we left certain films. I'm trying to think now, but there's a couple where we left and we were like, whoa, after we saw the reaction, like, ooh, we didn't like it as much as people liked it. Like, right. oh, people love this more than us. And then, like, not to say this is the same level as Black Widow, but we loved Black Widow walking out and then saw some reaction that was, oh, people don't love it as much. Yeah. We loved this movie. And yeah. maybe people are a little more lukewarm on it than we thought, but we loved it. So we're, we were effusive in our praise last night. Yeah, yeah. What's your opening thought? I mean, yeah, I just had a blast. We were talking on the way to the theater about how there are certain movies in the MCU that you you walked out of feeling like so pumped in a very particular way. And I think a, a lot of that I associate with the the very end years of the Infinity Saga, like 2016 to 2019, when it just felt like everything was firing on all cylinders. It felt like there was this like like Marvel, there was a there was a, a bit there where they just couldn't miss. Like it was like everything was was fun and funny and driving it forward, and it was like it was just it was wild. Like the the you know going to to Spider Man no or sorry uh, Spider Man Homecoming in in summer twenty seventeen, and then Ragnarok in in November it was just like oh my god Black Panther. Black Panther Infinity War like just wild, and this is the most I've felt like that since that period. Which is not to say it's the best movie since then. That's a different conversation. But it is very good. Dude, I mean, it's it's certainly... It, it, it's, for me, immediately in, in the top three uh, post-Endgame films. Like, I, I, I had... I was beaming. Yes. I, I felt... I, I like, grabbed your knee, like... Five times, like this is a goal. Oh my god! I, I, I like it, it. The fun thing for me, like exactly what you were saying, like you you walk out sometimes, and and even movies that I've loved, there are times where I recognize things that that other people may not like, and and not because they're bad, but just because all, like we've talked about so much, so much of Phase Four has been these kind of big creative swings, and. I, I was always having to say, like, for example, when people would ask me, like, Multiverse of Madness or Thor, Love, and Thunder, what did you think? You always have to preface it with the, like, well, it's weird, okay? just It's weird, right? But if you like the weird, if you like this kind of Sam Raimi weird, have you seen the Evil Dead movies? Do you like the Evil Dead movies? You're going <laughs> to like this. Like, do you like Taika? Do you like really goofy Taika? Do you really like it? Then you're going to like Love and Thunder. And I, like, I just didn't feel that way at all last night. like I, uh, Even though... That's what's crazy. It is weird. It's the weirdest it thing goofy. they've done in years. Yeah, yeah. And we talk about that so much in next week's episode when you can actually talk about it because there, it, it, it's hard to explain. Like the swing is so big stylistically, but even the misses feel like appropriate or char yeah. or charming. It's yeah. so strange to explain I, to, to uh, us. Th so th what I guess what I want to say before we jump into these questions, which will is going to be such a fun way to, to do this. Yeah, that can drive the conversation, yeah. I I just, because we were just talking about this with, with Black Adam, I think the thing that delighted me so much was just the clear buy-in of everyone involved. Which like, makes it so different. We just watched the press conference. It's so right. different. Like, I, so f first off, just so people know, in case you don't follow this stuff or live in our Slack, the... One of the big differences for this movie from the other Ant-Man films is on the writing side. Like, we've we've actually had Peyton Reed direct each of these. The first to finish a trilogy after John Watts. Um, also the first composer to, to finish one after Chikino. Uh, and we were so curious going into this. Okay, like, they, they have this new writer in Jeff Loveness who wrote this script just like Michael Waldron solo penned. Multiverse of Madness, Jeff Loveness, solo penned this. Also, they are both Rick and Morty alum. Uh, and so they kind of bring that weird comedy, sci-fi, like trippy thing to the right. table. Very uh, much so. And we were curious, right? Like, yeah, what, is it, what does it look like? Like Peyton Reed has so far directed these two films that fit very much kind of in his 
prior repertoire of, of like big budget comedies. Sure. Like for instance, he did the, the Yes Man film with Jim Carrey that was like two thousand seven. Right. And, um, uh, Zoe Deschanel. Yeah, like that that kind of like you know, it, it there's a cleanliness to it. Like it, 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 it just it's a it's sleek, you know, like he's he's kinda had that like more like what we were talking about kind of going into it even like sort of a steady hand on the wheel guy like mm-hmm. he's not a de- I, I think of all the MCU directors that showed up in the Infinity Saga he would probably be the one that would have been hardest to to identify like his fingerprint right because like in part the creative stuff behind those sure. movies like it was it was going to be Edgar Wright Edgar Wright wrote the script he departed the project like it was just always hard to figure out what was coming from where and I think that, like, just th- the reason I back up and say all this is I think that, that what he brought to this film, one, I now kind of know what the Peyton Reed fingerprint is, and I really respect it. Mm-hmm. And two, I think mm-hmm. it just set the tone for for everything that followed, and you hear that in the press conference. Because, like, the Peyton Reed combo with that Jeff Loveness Wild script is, I think, exactly what... Yes. Thor, Love, and Thunder and Multiverse of Madness didn't have, you know, again, yes. whether, like, for better or for worse, like, and, and I think here... We talk a lot about that balance next week. Yeah, yes, and 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 so, like, one, I love the Jeff Loveness script. I thought it was hilarious. Yes. I, it, it was also, like, really imaginative, like you said. So imaginative. Like, Holy... Suspenseful no and all, like, the best, like, like, gravitas. Like, it felt like... You don't know what's actually going to happen yeah. while you're watching the film. It, it was, and, and so... In case, again, folks don't know, what's really fun about that is Loveness is is already set to write Avengers Kang Dynasty, which is the first Avengers film coming out since Endgame in, in several years. And so, you know, obviously it, that's great because we see here that he can work well with a, a story that involves Kang, but also just I really like what he's bringing anyway. I, I'm stoked. And so, anyway, that that's just I w- I loved that I loved their combo, but I also loved l- listening to the press conference how much Peyton Reed got into the like the the ima- the actual imagining of the quantum realm. Like he went on and on about how like he was looking at actual like like stills from high powered microscope microscopes. Yeah, and, true. Like, Paul Rudd is saying that. He thought that that was all like, oh man, that's a really cool concept. Like art. storyboarding, yeah. Yeah, and Peyton Reed was like, no, 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 like this is like they were doing that with a combination of like going back to like, like Fifth Element and like Flash Gordon and just doing, like talking about like uh, going to old eighties like heavy metal magazines for visuals, just trying to pull from all of it, and it's so creative. Yeah, it's so fun, so fun, and and all the all I mean the the performances follow that and that like Beck's score is top notch the actors are just like firing on all cylinders it's the music is unbelievable and I'm only reserving my thoughts on that because I know one of the questions from one of our friends from work plus people is about that so I'll get in that, get into that in one second um, I'm not going to repeat everything you just said because I totally agree like I totally agree um, I'm going to just take one last chance to wrestle with this idea of like, if this comes out and has like a 72% or a 78%, like why? Because I loved it that much Mm -hmm. when, when my opinion was not influenced at all last night and you'll hear next week, this was, I don't rank things early on, but like my first experience was definitely top 10 for me. That was a, I love it. I love the imaginative. I love I love the imagination, I should say. I love the new world building. I love the villain, the actors that played the characters that they're playing, the music. Like, I'm not going to repeat everything, but I loved it. Like, I yeah. I had a hard time coming up with stuff I don't like. Now, how in the world can I be that effusive in my praise if there are a lot of lukewarm reviews that now I'm seeing? Um, and I was thinking about that this morning. This is my last thought. So if you're worried about the lukewarm reviews, I think it, it can maybe come from a couple of places. One, it is so, so creative, unique, weird, stylistically quirky. Like, if you were a fan of the way the first two Ant-Man films felt, like if if palate cleanser was not a bad word to you, like you were like, yeah, I love how like lighthearted it is and 
And I'm not bashing that. My mom, Candace, Annika, they love the just like feel good side story nature of the film. Super accessible. It's super accessible. I can see how this is like, what am I watching? You, it does not feel in that way. Okay, it does wrap up the trilogy, but doesn't feel like a continuation of the same exact genre from what it was. This is also just an Ant-Man that's having to take things more seriously in yeah. general. So it is a little bit, not to say it's not funny because it's still hilarious. Yeah. But gosh, it's so good. I think it's so good. But I can see how that turns some people off. Um, secondly, you know, what's interesting is like, I was walking out of the theater thinking like, this is such an obvious candidate for a movie where the audience score is going to be higher than the critic score. Yeah. We're in Los Angeles right. on the right. premiere night and just the, the vibe of the people walking out, like we could overhear a few things was almost like shocking to you and I, yeah. and it just a reminder that there are people out there that are like, I don't know how to say this. I want to be kind, but there are people out there that just don't want to like things yeah. like they right. want, like the internet wants to build momentum negatively on something, which is so strange to us because yeah. that is the exact opposite of what we want to do. But I'm not saying that to say this isn't actually legitimately good. Yeah. It's legitimately spectacular to right. me and just so much fun. That's the kicker. It's it's hard to make a movie that you just have so much fun in yeah. and have critics also love it. I just, I'm, I'm a little bit surprised that anybody who likes these things, like you like film, right. but specifically you like the Marvel Cinematic Universe, that you can walk out of that and go like, nah, Meh, yeah. like I don't, meh, I don't appreciate their effort. Like yeah. what? Man, it's, a, yeah, it's, it's an interesting thing. It was thing. so much fun. I like, like I, do people not like just having fun anymore? That's what, that, anyways, well, I, that's I, what I was thinking about this morning. It's, yeah. it's funny cause on, and you know, I, I'd be fascinated to, to see someone do a better study of this than what I can do. But I feel like as Marvel has, has grown and grown, um, I mean, Jonathan Majors in the, in the press conference, we, tw we tweeted this earlier. He described the MCU as an international pillar of culture, education, and entertainment. You know, yes. like, and, you know, you look at it, right? And you look at the number of, you know, like my little brother uh, was, was two years old when Iron Man came out. You know, and now he's about to graduate high school. And, and yeah. he's literally, like, grown up alongside the MCU. And there are a lot of folks like that, that like this is, this has become a big chunk of their experience with movies. And so I wonder if like, as that's happened and as more and more folks are kind of brought into the fold and as critics are having to take these more and more seriously in the amount of, of at least time and kind of airspace they dedicate to it. And the goalpost just keeps moving. Well, and I just wonder if you're, you're getting more and more people that have to cover these movies that wish that they didn't or or like maybe it's like people are putting certain sure. certain kinds of expectations i mean but this is why we have to talk about the menu yeah people yeah. are losing the ability to like go back to the joy of the thing like yeah, we're getting yeah. to a point where we hyper analyze everything that we're not actually enjoying the thing well, and that's that's like what what I want to. You're right, and what I want to clarify, and that's is, what we'll get into on that. Episode. It's not like I think people hear that, and this is such an important distinction to me. Yeah, and I don't want to sound preachy, but no, 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 no. But people can hear that and think, hey, you know, just let people enjoy things. Just like put put your critical brain aside and just enjoy yeah, everything. Sure, sure, and that's not what I'm saying or what we're saying. What we're saying is. I, I think that there is a fundamental difference in the way that we have, have now taught ourselves to consume things because of the way that, that the social media interactions happen where it's like we're now watching a movie to have a take on it. Like yeah, that's sure. the thing, right? Like you're watching it and you're thinking like – We were literally in a theater of people doing that. Yeah, I mean because you, you go out and you do your social media reactions. I mean like you're – that's what you do and it's like – and if you're not a, a – if you're not a member of the the movie press doing this stuff, then you're doing it on Letterbox or just doing it on socials anyway. And it's like you think about as you're watching it. Like I always, <laughs> I give Candace a hard. T Candace is not an example of this, but I give her a hard time because we'll be watching a movie at home and like three quarters of the way in, she starts crafting her Letterbox review, and I'm always like, No, you just watch the movie and <laughs> go back. But it, I just think it's like if if we're already thinking about the product that this movie is going to give us in this, like my, my analysis of it that I can now share with everyone or where does this move the MCU along and how does that like, it's just, yeah, yeah. it's not going to be a fun way to, to, to consume anything because it is like, 
just respond to it. Like, honestly, like, enjoy it. And I think that you would... I've found I'm not again I'm not being preachy I'm talking to myself and that like be willing to let yourself have fun with it this has been a conversation you and I've been having just personally like internally for the past couple months where it's like man I it's exhausting trying to trying to figure out like what every like what you should think about a thing just think the thing that you think like like enjoy it and so, like, my final note before I, I, we jump love, into, like, I love the, Robbie Rance. the questions. This is an epic Robbie Rance. No, but I totally agree with everything you're saying, obviously. I just, I, I would say, and, and this sounds like, I, I, don't, I don't mean this to sound pandering, because this is actually what I've done for this particular film, and I've really enjoyed it already. Like, you're listening to this podcast, which is obviously, you know, coloring your perception of the movie you're going to see. Sure. But, like... I have, this is the first time for a Marvel movie since, gosh, I don't even know how long. I mean, probably way pre-Infinity War even, that I have not, like, searched for any early reactions to stuff Mm -hmm. other than just, like, what we heard from the theater walking out and kind of made a point not to, like, and just come into it. And it's so, like... I don't know. It's so much. It's so much better. Like I, I would just encourage people to maybe hold off on that this time. And I don't like. I, I don't know how it's going to come out review wise. Maybe this is all. Maybe it's going to be ninety nine percent. Right. Like. Yeah. Yeah. I think the audience score will be higher than the critic score. And by the way, sorry for this truck that's just backing up constantly right outside the window here. Um, yeah. I again, we'll get into this with like the menu. I think I've been wrestling with that exact idea of just even the nature of what we're doing right now. Right. Like. I guess I, I guess I wonder truly what is the benefit other than it's like you can't wait for Christmas. Like yeah, if you, right. you can't wait to open your present, so it's like you're just kind of peeking at the label. Right. I'm just wondering if like yeah. I don't want people to stop listening to what we're doing. No, 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 but, no but, 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 but like yeah. yeah, like I guess to some people there's a level of information that can enhance, like, hey, look out for this thing from like Beck. Right. Like be listening for this because then you'll catch it. Right. There's stuff like that that's really cool. But like, yeah. To go in having heard people be like, uh, it's a meh thing. Right. I don't know why that is beneficial. I think go in being like, or I don't think it's a go to these movies ever so often. Yeah. And it's really fun. And I can't wait to see what, like, where they take me. <laughs> and, then, and then if you don't like yeah. it, that's fine. <laughs> on, on the on the flip side, even, like, there have been movies that, that are so, they're sold to me as such a triumph for, for oh, months sure. and months. And then you watch it. You're like, okay. That was yeah. Good. And it's like, I kind of wish I had gone into this without expectation, like without that kind of, you know, and again, I'm not saying that we shouldn't have dialogues about this stuff at all. I'm just saying like, even with our podcast, I think we're trying to be intentional as we're kind of directing it moving forward. Like, I think the, I think the point of all of these and the point of this podcast and the community that we've tried to build is it's fun to talk, like to talk and, and, and respond to art together. Right. And I know I get like, we get eye rolls whenever we, we talk about this stuff that way, but it's like, so I'm not saying to cut down on that, but I just think it's so much more fun to, to like sit with, with a thing and experience it and then share your experience with other people that experienced it rather than us have to immediately jump to like, is it an A or a B? Is it a thumbs up or a thumbs down? You know? So right. I, this is it, a fun movie for me and yeah, I want people to have fun. It was so much fun. I I just I have a hard time thinking that if you I've said this already, but if you are invested in the MCU, you care about Scott Lang, you care about Hank Pym, these characters, mm-hmm. and you're curious about where it's gonna go in the future, and like you're wondering if they can do something stylistically different, even though they've made 30 films already. Like if you're thinking all these things, I have a hard time thinking you went into this with a fresh mind and left being like, oh, that's dumb. Okay, let's get into some of these questions. Yes. So this is going to be – we're going to have to go real rapid fire with these because there's a lot of them. So, And, again, we don't want to spoil anything. So in context of everything we just said, we'll keep it real tight. And, by the way, I I do want to add, I don't think – I'm not going to start a larger discussion. But I don't think 
to clarify, this is going to have at all the same polarization of Thor Love and Thunder right. or Multiverse of Madness. I think there might just be a little more meh or lukewarmness about it. Like, I, I definitely don't see anyone walking out of this and going, I hate this. Whereas, like, with Multiverse of Madness, because of Wanda and a few other things, I think right. people, some people hated it right. because, like, you messed up my character. Right. I don't think that's happening here. I don't think they're fundamentally <clears throat> changing maybe your belief on something. There might just be some, like, oh, it was fine. Right. Um, I didn't feel that way, but that would be my yeah. excellent. Okay. All right. Here we go. Just real fast. I'm going to try to pull these open and we'll go for it. Uh, I hope you guys enjoy as I have so many of them and maybe we can filter this as I'm going. But Do we each answer? Does one of us, do we alternate? How should we do this? However you, however the spirit leads. Okay. Um, did you find it easy to adjust to the new Cassie? And again, I haven't read these before. Um, how stressed should we expect to be? I, I very much found it easy to adjust the new Cassie. I think she did yeah. a great job. I think she looks more like what Cassie yeah. would look like at her age. And um, I think she carries a lot of the same heart that the original young Cassie had, yeah. who is, by the way, my favorite child actor in the MZ. Totally agree. I was totally happy with Catherine Newton. Could not could not be happier. I never, I never thought to myself, like, wow, I wish this was a different casting. Right. Um, I would love to know if this movie actually feels like the start of a new phase or if it fits tonally with phase four or phase three. It definitely feels like the start of a new phase while having the anticipation yeah. of a phase three movie. I would say it's t it's totally like phase four in that in in the kind of like big ideas and, and you know, like we're phase four is much less grounded than phase three. And this is not a very good. But phase. and I can't remember where I said this now. I can't remember if I said it here or if I said it next week or whatever, mm -hmm. or we lost the file. <laughs> uh, um <laughs> It, this definitely feels like the line of demarcation, though, of, like, to me, this felt clear of, like, we are now going forward. Yeah, yeah. So, like, in that way, it truly did feel like a start of Phase 5, whereas yeah. most of Phase 4 was either new characters or legacy characters reflecting on what had happened. This felt like legacy character that's going forward. Yeah, yeah. That's I, – I'm also, just since we mentioned Phase 4, I would recommend folks, um, if you have – you know, if you're on your own rewatch – it, it's not like you have to sprint through it, but if you're looking for some homework to do in addition to the comic stuff that we're doing on the sure. on the Patreon, um, I would I would really encourage people to rewatch Loki because uh, second question, if any, how much does Loki series play into this film? Wow, yeah, I mean, uh, like a good bit. I think, yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, not, we can't answer that specifically. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I would just say like if you if you haven't seen it, you're not. Like you're not going to be confused, um, but I think that if it's fresh on your mind, you'll appreciate it. Knee jerk reaction, which is what we just said we wouldn't do um, in the rankings department. Um, where would you put it, and how does it compare to other trilogies? Um, we're not going to rank it. It, it. Look, look, Infinity War is my number one. Has an eighty two percent round tomatoes. Right. Yeah. That's hard for me to reconcile. That somebody could think that movie was garbage um, or rotten. Yeah. Um, I'm nervous that Infinity War, Black Widow, and now Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania are going to be the three movies that I am so much higher than the yeah. average consensus. So from I'll say this. I think the critic score is going to be like 75%, and I would say it was a top tier for me. Yeah, I would say it's, it's – So uh, it does not match the 75% for me. It's one of my. It's one of it's one. Of, I can't do this yet, but it's, it's one, one of my, my ten favorite films. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's one of my favorite Marvel films out the gate. I think. I really. I, I just. We just had fun. I just had it. I loved it. I loved it. It, it. it. Last thing on the fun department. The way Wanda Gr Wanda Vision Wanda Grision <laughs> Wanda Vision leaned into the grief is what I was gonna say. The way it Picturing leaned like into the grief <laughs> with like the Wanda outfit. The way it, it leaned, stop. Some the way it stop. <laughs> the way it leaned into the grief so heavily. That's one of the reasons I respect that show so much. Is like they right. went into that. This is the same thing for me, but with fun. Right. It's like we forget that that's another emotion that you can like another experience you can have with these films. Yeah. It doesn't just have to be heavy or dark. There are like I need all of that. Right. I want the balance of the darkness and the 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 brute violence and the right. and the dark stories and the hopelessness and then I want the grief and having to sit with that and that's what Phase Four did so well. But also, I want to have fun sometimes. Like some of the characters yeah. can be in a good spot. Right, right. 
And Dude, that was fun. Yeah, it's a, it's a blockbuster. And and there are emotional there are emotional moments within the context yeah, it's of this. not cheap, but but yeah, it never feels shallow is is an important thing. Like I think if don't equate fun with shallow. It's fun because it takes you on a meaningful story. It's about like it's a it's a movie that's about family and about these relationships that we've been exploring for the past two films and that's handled really well but in a way that's also like hilarious and thrilling at times. I mean legitimately thrilling at times. In a non-spoilery way, I'd love to know if Kang reveals anything about an older project as in like are there any current MCU projects now better or different in light of Quantum Mania? For example, the way WandaVision made Civil War more compelling for Wanda's character. Without spoiling anything, I'm not going to get into this one because I don't want to spoil anything. I, I don't. I don't think so. Not. Not really. Don't look because for that. it goes forward. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would say like, you know, again, and this is. He Who Remains versus Kang here. And I think that that's maybe the, that's yeah, the best maybe, answer to yeah, that question. Loki, I guess, yeah. Uh, but other than that, I don't, I don't think that I'm curious good. about Beck's score, and, and this is why I love this question. By the way, these first questions are all from our friends from Word Plusers, so. Oh, nice. If you want to be read first, <laughs> be a friend from Word Plus. Um, is he able to work with his heisty Ant-Man theme, or does it have to have, like, a very different tone or something different? And um, you'll hear me talk about this at length next week. Uh, I love it so much. This yeah. this might have been, upon first listen, his masterpiece. Because here, here's why. The first theme is already unbelievable, right? The dun, 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 dun. But the whole point of that theme is he was writing it to be a heist. Like, uh -huh. remember when I, I interviewed him and I said, I'm sneaking around. Yeah. And, <laughs> and that's what I said to him. He's right. like, totally. That's Remember I said, like, you're becoming the heist right. guy. And he's like, I'm totally becoming the heist guy. Um I cannot believe how well he does this. And um, props to Giacchino for doing this, where he can take the same physical notes. Yeah. And he can take those, but if he's playing them in the heist thing, it's like playful. Yeah. But in this movie, he takes that theme. I have chills right now. I, I literally have chills <laughs> on camera. He takes that theme and he goes like, he makes it bombastic. Bum, bum, yeah. bum, 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 bum. And it's like, and then he, and then he takes it and goes, do, 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 do. And it's all of a sudden depressing yeah. and so sad. And that's my favorite stuff. Well, and, and it's so good, dude. It's the, like, he has a dark theme for, like, he has a spinoff of that for Cassie and for Kang. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and like, there's kind of a quantum realm theme I noticed that's really cool. But also one of my favorite themes of his has been the the wasp theme that he added, like in addition to kind of ramping up the Ant-Man Just theme. wait till you see like Dude, some of the musical. Oh, the wasp, like that, that one, like go, go right now. If you're curious, our, our journey through the MCU playlist has a sampling yeah. of a ton of Christopher Spotify. stuff. Um, but yeah, search journey through the MCU on the friends from work, Spotify, but there's a song that you should listen to right now. Um, that is the what it's, it's not over till the wasp lady sings. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And it's just then basically the overture, uh, yeah for the for that that Ant Man and the Wasp score. And yeah, it's it's that man, it, it reminds me of Chikino uh in that like the the third installment the, the difference being I was a bigger fan of of Beck's work on the first films than I was on, of Chikino's work on the first two Spider Man films. But in the same way that Chikino like brings home to this like yeah, what you were saying, like makes things that were initially playful now really meaningful. Beck does that, but much more like cinematic in scope. It's instead of being like heart wrenching, it's like people think that pounding. we just say positive things about all composers. But for me, I'll just out myself. Like Beck is my very top of the of the MCU. Like yeah. he's one through five, and he's not five or four probably. <laughs> like he's somewhere in there. It's um, it, it's so. I, I think about Beck's scores the way that I think about Daredevil comics, which is like. If you look at some of the most, cons like if you want the most consistently good MCU scores. Side note, that's another example. John Pazino, the Daredevil theme is. Yeah. But when he finally gets a suit at the end of the first season, he does a whole, or and I asked him about yeah, this, whole yeah. orchestra's fault. You know, yeah, it's like. Yeah. Bum, bum, 
them. And all of a sudden it's like, so I love when they can do that. Yeah, yeah. Love when they can do that. Okay, here we go. Now we need to really blaze, okay? okay. These are on Instagram. How does the movie set the stage for future events? Can't spoil anything plot-wise, but it definitely feels like we're going forward. Yeah. Is Very this the well. beginning of a new dynasty? Yeah. Same question. No answer, and we're going forward. How many Kangs do you foresee in the MCU? Like, how many Kangs do you foresee the MCU, MCU introducing? Sorry, that was hard for me to say. And which ones would you like to see? Yeah. No, com no comment. Yeah. No comment. <laughs> I love that. Should the MCU have started with a younger Hank so next gen could have been Scott? No. Yeah. No. Because Paul Rudd is already incredible. He doesn't age, first of all. So yeah, he doesn't dude, look seriously. like he's old. Um, Not it, just in the movie, in the press conference. Which and is, you have the ability now to pass that gene to Cassie. Yeah. Potentially. That's not smart. I'm just saying, like, she's the younger generation there. And Hank still shows up in this dude, film. This is I mean, my, yeah, he, this is yeah. far and away my, my favorite Michael Douglas performance in the MCU. So I, I think, because I came in, we were talking about that. Like, is, yeah, what's the role for Hank in this? And, yeah, great, great Hank movie. I one am. word to describe each main character's arc in the movie. Spoiler free. Oh, gosh. Sorry about this truck again. Golly. Yeah. I don't even, I don't trust myself to, yeah, 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 to yeah, do yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. this that, that's too dangerous of a question because, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Come on. Was it awesome? Yeah. I mean. How many times did you pass out? Um, none, but we were pumped. Is Jan, oh, you're going to love this. Is Janet's role going to satisf satisfy those who felt like Pfeiffer was underutilized previously? Oh, my gosh. I 10 trillion percent. Yeah. We included Michelle Pfeiffer as a standout yeah. in our original tweet. And I call her out next week. Which I like, what I love about that is I She's totally, awesome. I totally felt like she was both underutilized and just not, not quite locked in, in Ant-Man and the Wasp. And so it's, yeah, I mean, I was, I was not coming into this with high hopes for Michelle Pfeiffer. And if anything, I was a little like, because I, I don't think she was bad in Ant Man and the Wasp, but because I didn't connect to that to that role, I was a little bit like, are they going to lean too much into that? And I just didn't. She, right out the gate in this one, is just killing it all the way through. Um, I'm skipping a few of these because there's so many, and some of them are asking the same kind of question. But um, Modok, I just want to say one thing about Modok. This is actually one thing I think I can influence before mm. the film. Um. It's so funny. Let yourself embrace the like how goofy the character is. Please do not go into this thinking like Modoc needs to be some. Do you know what I'm saying? Well, the, like and, set yeah, your I mean, expectation on having fun with the film. Don't set your expectation on like. The, I mean, don't yeah, put your hope, yeah. <laughs> your, well, the, your the, worth the, in Modoc. <laughs> <laughs> don't put your worth in. <laughs> The, yeah, I mean, the, the, and the funny thing there is the, to the people that do, which already e existed, I think I saw online some controversy, but like like way back when they first released images, it's just so funny because like P Peyton Reed was talking about this in the in the presser, like Modoc is a ridiculous character. It's a giant face, like so. The idea that that <laughs> yeah, we would right. come to that character. As though it's like with any kind of seriousness to it, right? Like as though they're adapting like a Victorian novel or something. <laughs> like I don't. <laughs> but yeah, man, one of my favorite Jeff Loveness and Peyton Reed both called out Modoc as as one of their favorite parts of the film, and I was because I view him as sort of a just kind of silly character in the comics that I don't feel very passionately about. I was always curious why that was, and. There's, I feel like I'm, that's I'm looking at five questions about Modoc. Wow. I loved it, but this is coming from someone who knows nothing about the comics. I don't know anything about Modoc other than it's a totally goof thing, like goofy looking thing. I do wonder, I mean, there was the Patton Oswalt show. I don't know how many of yeah. our listeners watched that and, and, and are sort of bringing that in. This is weird to answer. Any Luis and no is the answer. Luis is not in the film. Yeah. And Michael Pena is literally Probably our favorite part, maybe outside of Paul Rudd, of the first two films. Yeah, yeah. But I don't mean this as a slight. You don't miss him. You'll you'll understand. Like he wasn't needed for the film, right? In my opinion. No, no, no. I agree. I mean, I I, I didn't even think about it until uh, until the end. 
Like whenever I was yeah. like, oh wait, yeah, we missed this whole chunk because I was just and watching the credits. Yeah. Uh, quickly to wrap this up, who were you most surprised with their performance? For me, it's Pfeiffer. I think Michelle Pfeiffer. Yeah, I think the other one would be Michael Douglas for me. All right, to my wife who wrote, did you get Chipotle or Five Guys? I got Five Guys, sweetheart. <laughs> um, she said, maybe you want to get Chipotle just if it sits a little lighter before the theater. But I was like, no, I haven't eaten since <laughs> six in the morning. Um, how's the CGI? I'll I was you, really hoping. I was really hoping they managed to make the Quantum Realm look good and real. It's phenomenal. Now, let me say something really quickly. We watched this in IMAX, a great theater. Yeah. We watched it in IMAX, so the score is a huge impact in IMAX for me because there's yeah. awesome sub, like great bass coverage. So mm-hmm. like the score, the big moments hit you. Like you feel them in your chest. Like literally a couple of times my, my feet were rumbling, Yeah. which I love. So the score is enhanced in IMAX. Uh, visually, I thought it was, what do you think? I thought it was fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. I mean, obviously they're in a quantum realm, but the imagination right. and the way they pull that off, like, yeah, it is a green screen. Yeah. They're not on location <laughs> in the quantum realm, but it's, yeah. it's believable to me. Dude, w- one thing that I, that I, I love about that, that I don't even think we mentioned in the initial reactions is, do, do you remember how, you know, as, as much as the first two Ant-Man films were largely, like we said, kind of ground level and accessible, we did have those peeks into the quantum realm in both films that got like kind of trippy and more Dr. Strange esque in the visuals. And one thing that I know MCU fans have seized on for years now is that like little clip that we get in Ant-Man and the Wasp when Hank is shrinking down to go rescue Janet. And we see like what looks like little cities in the background. Yes. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yes. And I, I love, yeah, I love that they, I mean, we, we get that. Like we, we return, we don't return to that exact moment, but we like carries the similar vibe. Yeah. I mean, it's like, it, it, it feels like if you got to zoom in on those and see, and like, again, to go back to the beginning, like, and it makes the TVA uh, landscape look more understandable slash believable, you know, they, yeah, they right. by the window. Right. I thought about that too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's uh which makes, you know, I mean, I think I was, that was another surprise of mine just looking at what I would have expected from Peyton Reed, both like the, the degree to which he, he like really went for it with, with sources and with kind of introducing various elements, but also just the, the execution. Last couple here. A lot of questions on Kang. Um, this one in particular, I think, is interesting. Does this do justice to Kang or Kang justice the same way Guardians does to Thanos? And I would say you'll hear us talk about this next week. It's better. Yeah, it's better. The oh, way yeah. that, Thanos oh, yeah, shows Guardians? up. With Guardians. And I, w- I want to bring that one up now because I also want to tie in the visual aspect you were talking about. Mm-hmm. One oh, thing you yeah. point out in the episode next week to me, which is really interesting, is like not only are we stoked about Kang as a character Mm -hmm. and not only are we stoked about Jonathan majors as the actor to play that character for the next, however long, but also the fact that it's just refreshing. This guy is a human. So you don't have to do any of the visual tricks. Not that they're, they're amazing with Thanos, but like you don't have to have any of this stupid she Hulk debate because it's a human portraying this, which is actually going to be really refreshing. I think on, on the visual front and on the Kang front. So in that, in that way, visually, and the tone and stuff, this is a better entrance for Kang than Thanos was to Guardians. I don't, yeah. even, I don't even think that's debatable. No, and, and I would say, like, one thing about Thanos is, even aside from appearance, I think it, I don't think that Thanos <clears throat> showed up in the, in, like, we think of Thanos as compelling because of Infinity War. The last two movies. Yeah, and and, and it's different, right? Because that was the same character, and, and in part, like, again, to, to go read kind of what Majors has been talking about with He Who Remains versus Kang, you are getting different variants but even then it's just like it feels the difference to me is i think it took marvel a while to figure out who thanos was in the mcu and how they wanted to use him but now yeah they know exactly that it feels like they have a plan and and i would just say like on because i didn't say this earlier i am have been since loki but am like unbelievably stoked that Marvel has has tied themselves to major for the the multiverse saga like yeah we just watched the press conference and it only reiterates I, that thought it is like he's incredible like as an he's one of my favorite actors but in also off screen right he's bought in 
so bought in. And, and I just feel like you will come away from this movie. I think even honestly, the, the stuff that, I, that, that we've talked about, like, I think even if people dislike parts of this movie, no one's going to have an issue with Major's performance. And, and I think that, like, I just, we've talked so long about having, right, like a villain that, that you can, like, move ahead with. Yeah. And we've never had that. Because even Thanos, it was like that he was in the background more than anything. But, like, I just, I think it's going to be, it, it's the best decision that Kevin Feige and Go have made in, in a spell, I think. Right, because even, like, Gore, if, like, you, you probably couldn't have gotten Christian Bale to sign on for five years. Right. As a character. So the fact that you got an actor like this to also commit and buy in to the same degree to make this like his performance that like he's remembered by right. is right. crazy. And it's awesome. Um, last thing. Oh, uh, wait, wait. Can I say one more thing sure. about Majors? Just sure. because he's. I, I love I, it. He said this in the press conference and I loved it. Um, he was he was talking about how he approached Kang and again, doing it with so much sincerity, you know, like it, it, it does not feel put on um, or like he's he's somehow viewing this as a lesser project than his other performances but he talked about his process and how to him it's like he, he talked about like doing Shakespeare yeah. and he talked about how it's like learning the structure of the character and learning like inside and out like what what he said like I think he, he talked about the like the backbone of the character but essentially like studying it, doing a deep dive, figuring that out, but then also figuring out the the characters and the actors playing those characters that you're going to be with. Like he talked about the the deep dive into like Tom Hiddleston ahead of, of Loki and then that with Paul Rudd and like how he is, he seems so dedicated on like a level that we've, we've only seen with a handful of, like again, I think so many Marvel performers have bought in. We were saying that earlier, but then there's like a top tier of folks like Tom Hiddleston that are like, they love it. They love it and they like are doing their own deep dives and mining their own like past projects and like he's bringing that level to it but then he also talked about how he's bringing this play to it where it's like you figure out your character and then there's almost like the the, the like quasi-improv element of like now you're just playing and you see where the scene goes and like it explains so much about what I love from his performances because they feel just so electric and alive and it's like, he is a guy that I think understands because he does the work. He understands the character that he's portraying and he's also there in this very visceral way. Like there's a presence of the performance that I just, I, I, I'm such a fan and, and I, I can't wait to see him in Creed three. I can't wait to see him in more Marvel movies. I think people are really going to love him as King here. Um, in closing, you brought up something that I think is actually a fascinating discussion, maybe for another time. But, um, you know, a lot of times I think the popular opinion from the outside of non MCU fans is that Marvel like really had it all together in their planning and their details back when it was like phase one, two, three, right. that was like their perfect plan. And now it's so scatterbrained and like things are getting loose and stuff. Right. Having seen this movie and, and then listen, you talk about Thanos a second ago. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting that. I could make an argument that it might actually be in some ways a little bit the inverse of that, what people think, yeah. in that, yes, in the first three phases, they knew they wanted to anchor it around Robert Downey Jr. and Chris Evans and, and their characters. Mm -hmm. And they knew they wanted to anchor it around the Infinity Stones and that at some point somebody would want to get them. But even those, yeah. they didn't know that until, I don't know, 2013, 14? Yeah. yeah. So even that, they didn't start with that. And then – they retroactively then were able to like go back and make the Tesseract something more important. And they were able to make Thanos like, oh, he was actually behind more of this earlier on. Like part of the talk. genius of Endgame is that right. he did that work. Right. And we talked about that in Guardians 1 where even Gunn was like, yeah, they asked me to include Thanos in this. Mm -hmm. Well, that wasn't the first movie they made. It's not like that was like the, the groundwork laid and now we know to go. Right. So ironically now, especially starting with this film, like phase four, new characters, like who knows how they're going to bring that all together yet. Right. I don't know that. Right. But starting with this film, they now have the opposite luxury, which is like you now know that these people are signed on for X amount of time and you can already now project every project yeah. for the next two two phases yeah. of like where it's going to go. 
Yeah. yeah. And they didn't have that luxury when they didn't know if it was going to work with Iron Man. So that's actually kind of wild. Yeah. And no, I think, I think that's a good way of putting it. And, and which by the way, in, in case anyone's listening to this and they think we just spoiled the, the movie because we're talking about more Kang appearances. We're talking about that because that's like, we have the film called King dynasty and, and Kevin Feige's really talked about. Well, and also let me remind you, he spoiler for Loki, he dies in Loki and yet right. you see him in this trailer. Right. So that's right. my point. So yeah, I, like, that's <laughs> not, that. that's no commentary on like what happens in this movie with this version Correct. of King that we're getting. I just don't want, and cause some people may not realize why we're assuming that there are future Jonathan major sure. performances. Well, yeah, so. yeah. Also, yeah. Also it's called Kang dynasty. So right. I am assuming that <laughs> they wouldn't name it that early. Um, <laughs> The last question was, do you think that Scott Lang's podcast was inspired by the Friends from Work podcast? Maybe. Almost certainly. Yeah. In fact, at the press conference, he like took a, a few minutes to actually talk about that. Yeah. Like, we weren't even going to include that storyline until I heard Friends from Work. And then, you know, I, you know I, which we were like, you know, Paul, you don't have to bring that up, but But whatever. he insists, you know, yeah. and when, when Paul insists, I, that's what I always say about Paul. When he insists, yeah. you know, <laughs> <laughs> it was funny. Uh, Jimmy, Jimmy, Randall Park yeah. uh, was the the moderator for the the press conference, and uh, it became the like ongoing joke by the end that everyone, because all the main cast was there, and uh, by the end everyone was talking about how they based their performances on the work that Randall Park did as Jimmy. Woo. I do love Jimmy Woo <laughs> and, him and the Wasp. So and one division. And one division. Um, all right, guys, we'll go into it expecting to have fun and just let yourself have fun. That's my last plea. And we do this every time, but I'm gonna do it again. That intro uh, credit roll rolls. And I know I'm Pavlov's dogs, but I, in that theater, in that moment with you, I realized again, you only get so many of these. Like, yeah, it, it's not like promised to us that these are going to be infinitely good forever. Yeah. yeah so like yeah. that's our rolling. I'm like, let's go. Like, I'm going to enjoy this movie while I'm here, and I sure as heck did. So I hope you guys can do that as well. Um, there's so many logistical things we have to get into um, that I'll save for a different time and post online. But like I said, next week is our initial reactions episode. Enjoy the movie next weekend. Uh, listen to the episode when you are finished with that film. If you want a last-minute prep for this film and you're listening to this, go on our YouTube page and check out our saga so far and a little friendly reminder. We did uh, yeah. a shortened version of like something you could show your parents if you want to take them or your friend to the theater and they've never seen any Ant-Man film. That was our goal of making that. So just, you can find us on all socials and on YouTube and TikTok um, at the FFW podcast everywhere. And just so you know, the, the, and this, this time around was sort of unique for various reasons, but yeah, the saga so far here is intended more for, MCU fans. It's just like a fun recap that we did. But yeah, if you have folks that that are not necessarily MCU fans that you're trying to kind of sell on coming to the movie with you or just people that, you know, aren't going to take the amount of time to watch the full saga so far, uh, the friendly reminder is, is designed exclusively for them. And we really laid that out at the end of next week's episode, which is a long marathon, two-hour episode next week. But at the end of it, we really go through some of that stuff. And all the typical stuff. If you can, follow us on social media and check out our website, the FFWpodcast.com. There are a few shirts there for sale. You can donate to our podcast and, and help support the Friends from Work podcast. And there's also a contact form where you can reach out to us and you can tell us if you're Bob Iger and you're trying to sue us. Um, but we try to answer all those messages as well, which – is actually a fun part of this. Join our Slack if you want to get involved with like six or 700 other people that are just diehard MCU fans and just like hear the uh, Marvel news and chime in on this conversation. Um, but yeah, reach out to us and we can work We can work some of that stuff into the next episode and stuff like that. Um, as always, please tell your friends about the podcast, subscribe to it, rate, review, and then yeah, have fun. We'll see you next week, right? Yeah. We'll be right here talking about Amma and the Wasp, Quantumania next week here on Friends Report.